Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa by Rudolf Steiner From Mystics of the Renaissance and Their Relation to Modern Thought Published in German in 1901 Translated by Bertland Kitely in 1911 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa A gloriously shining star in the sky of the thought life of the Middle Ages is Nicholas Chrysippus of Cusa at Trevis, 1401 to 1464. He stands upon the summit of the knowledge of his time in mathematics he accomplished remarkable work in natural science he may be described as the forerunner of copernicus for he took up the standpoint that the earth is a moving celestial body like others nicholas of cusa sets out to mount from the knowledge one acquires in the isolated sciences up to the inner living experiences there can be no doubt that the excellent logical technique which the scholastics have developed and for which nicholas himself was educated forms the most effective means of attaining to these inner experiences even though the scholastics themselves were held back from this road by their positive faith but one can only understand nicholas fully when one reflects that his calling as a priest which raised him to the dignity of cardinal prevented him from coming to a complete breach with the faith of the church which found an expression appropriate to the age in scholasticism we find him so far along the road that a single step further would necessarily have carried him out of the church we shall therefore understand the cardinal best if we complete the one step more which he did not take and then looking backwards throw a light upon what he aimed at the most significant thought in nicholas's mental life is that of learned ignorance by this he means a form of knowing which occupies a higher level as compared with ordinary knowledge in the lower sense knowledge is a grasping of an object by the mind or spirit the most important characteristic of knowing is that it gives us light about something outside of the spirit that therefore it directs its gaze upon something different from itself the spirit therefore is concerned in the knowing process with things thought of as outside itself now what the spirit develops in itself about things is the being of those things the things are spirit man sees the spirit so far only through the sensible encasement what lies outside the spirit is only this sensible encasement the being of the things enters into the spirit if then the spirit turns its attention to this being of the things which is of like nature with itself then it can no longer talk of knowing for it is not looking at anything outside of itself but is looking at something which is part of itself is indeed looking at itself it no longer knows it only looks upon itself it is no longer concerned with a knowing but with a not knowing no longer does man grasp something through the mind he beholds without conceiving his own life this highest stage of knowing is in comparison with the lower stages a not knowing but it is obvious that the essential being of things can only be reached through this stage of knowing thus nicholas of cusa in speaking of this learned not knowing is really speaking of nothing else but knowing come to a new birth as an inner experience he tells us himself how he came to this inner experience Quote, i made many efforts to unite the ideas of god and the world of christ and the church into a single root idea but nothing satisfied me until at last on my way back from greece by sea my mind's vision as if by an illumination from above soared up to that perception in which god appeared to me as the supreme unity of all contradictions End quote. 
To a greater or less extent, this illumination was due to influences derived from the study of his predecessors. One recognizes, in his way of looking at things, a peculiar revival of the views which we meet with in the writings of a certain Dionysius. The above-mentioned Scotus Erigena translated these works into Latin and speaks of their author as the great and divine revealer. The works in question are first mentioned in the first half of the sixth century. They were ascribed to that Dionysius, the Areopagite, named in the Acts of the Apostles, who was converted to Christianity by St. Paul. When these writings were really composed may here be left an open question. Their contents worked powerfully upon Nicholas, as they had already worked upon Scotus, Aragina, and as they must also have been in many ways stimulating for the ways of thinking of Eckhart and his colleagues. This learned not knowing is in a certain way performed in these writings, here we can only indicate the essential trait in the way of conceiving things found in these works man primarily knows the things of the sense world he forms thoughts about its being and action the primal cause of all things must lie higher than these things themselves man therefore must not seek to grasp this primal cause by means of the same concepts and ideas as things if he therefore ascribes to the root being god attributes which he has learned to know in lower things such attributes can be at best auxiliary conceptions of his weak spirit which drags down the root being to itself in order to conceive it in truth therefore no attribute whatsoever which lower things possess can be predicated of god it must not even be said that god is for being too is a concept which man has formed from lower things but god is exalted above being and not being the god to whom we ascribe attributes is therefore not the true god we come to the true God when we think of an over-God above and beyond any God with such attributes. Of this over-God we can know nothing in the ordinary sense. In order to attain to him, knowledge must merge into not knowing. One sees that at the root of such a view there lies the consciousness that man himself is able to develop a higher knowing which is no longer mere knowing in a purely natural manner on the basis of what his various sciences have yielded him the scholastic view declared knowledge to be impotent to such a development and at the point where knowledge is supposed to cease it called in to the help of knowledge a faith basing itself upon external revelation nicholas of cusa was thus upon the road to develop out of knowledge itself that which the scholastics had declared to be unattainable for knowledge thus we see that from nicholas of cusa's point of view there can be no question of there being only one kind of mode of knowing on the contrary for him knowing clearly divides itself into two first into such knowing as mediates our acquaintance with external objects, and second into such as is itself the object of which one gains knowledge. The first mode of knowing is dominant in the sciences, which teaches us about the things and occurrences of the outer world. The second is in us when we ourselves live in the knowledge we have acquired this second kind of knowing grows out of the first now however it is still one and the same world with which both these modes of knowing are concerned and it is one and the self-same man who is active in both hence the question must arise whence comes it that one and the self-same man develops two different kinds of knowledge of one and the same world already in connection with toller the direction could be indicated in which the answer of this question must be sought 
here in nicholas of cusa this answer can be still more definitely formulated in the first place man lives as a separated individual being amidst other separated beings in addition to the effects which the other beings produce on each other there arises in his case the lower knowledge through his senses he receives impressions from other beings and works up these impressions with his inner spiritual powers he then turns his spiritual gaze away from external things and beholds himself as well as his own activity in so doing self-knowledge arises in him but so long as he remains on this level of self-knowledge he does not in the true sense of the word behold himself he can still believe that some hidden being is active within him whose manifestations and effects are only that which appears to him to be his own activities but now the moment may come in which through an incontrovertible inner experience it becomes clear to the man that he experiences in what he perceives or feels within himself not the manifestation or effect of any hidden power or being but this very being itself in its most essential and intimate form then he can say to himself in a certain way i find all other things ready given and i myself standing apart from and outside of them add to them whatever the spirit has to tell about them but what i thus creatively add to the things in myself therein do i myself live that is myself my very own being but what is that which speaks there in the depths of my spirit it is the knowledge which i have acquired of the things of the world but in this knowledge there speaks no longer an effect a manifestation that which speaks expresses itself wholly holding back nothing of what it contains in this knowledge there speaks the world in all its immediacy but i have acquired this knowledge of things and of myself as one thing among other things from out of my own being i myself speak and the things too speak thus in truth i am giving utterance no longer only to my own being i am also giving utterance to the being of things themselves my ego is the form the organ in which the things express themselves about themselves i have gained the experience that in myself i experience my own essential being and this experience expands itself in me to the further one that in myself and through myself the all-being itself expresses itself or in other words knows itself i can now no longer feel myself as a thing among other things i can now only feel myself as a form in which the all-being lives out its own life it is thus only natural that one and the same man should have two modes of knowing judging by the facts of the senses he is a thing among other things and in so far as he is that he gains for himself a knowledge of these things but at any moment he can acquire the higher experience that he is really the form in which the all-being beholds itself then man transforms himself from a thing among other things into a form of the all-being and along with himself the knowledge of things transforms itself into the expression of the very being of things but as a matter of fact this transformation can only be accomplished through man that which is mediated in the higher knowledge does not exist as long as this higher knowledge itself is not present man becomes only a real being in the creation of this higher knowledge and only through man's higher knowledge can things also bring their being forth into real existence if therefore we demand that man shall add nothing to things through his inner knowledge but merely give expression to whatever already exists in the things outside of himself that would really amount to a complete abnegation of all higher knowledge 
from the fact that man in respect of his sensible life is merely one thing among others and that he only attains to the higher knowledge when he himself accomplishes with himself as a being of the senses the transformation into a higher being it follows that he can never replace the one kind of knowledge by the other his spiritual life consists on the contrary in a ceaseless oscillation between these two poles of knowledge between knowing and seeing if he shuts himself off from the seeing he abandons the real nature of things if he seeks to shut himself off from sense perception he would shut out from himself the things whose nature he seeks to know it is these very same things which reveal themselves alike in the lower knowing and the higher seeing only in the one case they reveal themselves according to their outer appearance in the other according to their inner being thus it is not due to the things themselves that at a certain stage they appear only as external things but their doing so is due to the fact that man must first of all raise and transform himself to the level upon which the things cease to be external and outside in the light of these considerations some of the views which natural science has developed through the nineteenth century appear for the first time in the right light the supporters of these views tell us that we hear see and touch the objects of the physical world through our senses the eye for instance transmits to us a phenomenon of light a color thus we say that a body emits red light when with the help of the eye we experience a sensation red but the eye can give us this same sensation in other cases also if the eyeball is struck or pressed upon or if an electric spark is allowed to pass through the head the eye has a sensation of light it is thus evident that even in the cases in which we have the sensation of a body emitting red light something may really be happening in that body which has no sort of resemblance to the color we sensate whatever may be actually happening outside of us in space so long as what happens is capable of making an impression on the eye there arises in us the sensation of light thus what we experience arises in us because we possess organs constituted in a particular manner what happens outside in space remains outside of us we know only the effects which the external happenings call up in us Hermann Hermholtz, 1821 to 1893, has given a clearly outlined expression to this thought. Quote, our sensations are simply effects which are produced in our organs by external causes, and the manner in which such an effect will show itself depends naturally enough altogether upon the kind of apparatus upon which the action takes place in so far as the quality of our sensation gives us information as to the particular nature of the external action which produces the sensation so far can the sensation be regarded as a sign or symbol of this external action but not as an image or reproduction of it for we expect in a picture some kind of resemblance to the object it represents thus in a statue resemblance of form in a drawing resemblance in the perspective projection of the field of view in a painting resemblance of color in addition a symbol however is not required to have any sort of resemblance to that which it symbolizes the necessary connection between the object and the symbol is limited to this that the same object coming into action under the same conditions shall call up the same symbol and that therefore different symbols shall always correspond to different objects when berries of a certain kind in ripening produce together red coloration and sugar then red color and a sweet taste will always find themselves together in our sensation of berries of this form End quote let us follow out step by step the line of thought which this view makes its own 
it is assumed that something happens outside of me in space this produces an effect upon my sense organs and my nervous system conducts the impressions thus made to my brain there another occurrence is brought about i experience the sensation red now follows the assertion therefore the sensation red is not outside not external to me it is in me all our sensations are merely symbols or signs of external occurrences of whose real quality we know nothing we live and move in our sensations and know nothing of their origin in the spirit of this line of thought it would thus be possible to assert that if we had no eyes color would not exist for then there would be nothing to translate this to us wholly unknown external happening into the sensation red for many people this line of thought possesses a curious attraction but nevertheless it originates in a complete misconception of the facts under consideration were it not that many of the present-day scientists and philosophers are blinded even to absurdity by this line of thought one would need to say less about it but as a matter of fact this blindness has ruined in many respects the thinking of the present day in truth since man is but one object or thing among other things it naturally follows that if he is to have any experience of them at all they must make an impression upon him somehow or other something that happens outside the man must cause something to happen within him if in his visual field the sensation red is to make its appearance the whole question turns upon this what is without what within outside of him something happens in space and time but within there is undoubtedly a similar occurrence for in the eye there occurs such a process which manifests itself to the brain when i perceive the color red this process which goes on inside me i cannot perceive directly any more than i can directly perceive the wave motions outside which the physicist conceives of as answering to the color red but really it is only in this sense that i can speak of an inside and an outside at all only on the plane of sense perception can the opposition between outside and inside hold good the recognition of this leads me to assume the existence outside of a process in space and time although i do not directly perceive it at all and the same recognition further leads me to postulate a similar process within myself although i cannot directly perceive that either but as a matter of fact i habitually postulate analogous occurrences in space and time in ordinary life which i do not directly perceive as for instance when i hear piano playing next door and assume that a human being in space is seated at the piano and is playing upon it and my conception when i speak of processes happening outside of and within me is just the same i assume that these processes have qualities analogous to those of the processes which do fall within the province of my senses only that because of certain reasons they escape my direct perception if i were to attempt to deny to these processes all the qualities which my senses show me in the domains of space and time i should in reality and in truth be trying to think something not unlike the famous knife without a handle whose blade was wanting therefore i can only say that space and time processes take place outside me that bring about space and time processes within me and both are necessary if the sensation red is to appear in my field of vision and in so far as this red is not in space and time i shall seek for it equally in vain whether i seek without or within myself those scientists and philosophers who cannot find it outside ought not to want to find it inside either for it is not inside in exactly the same sense in which it is not outside 
to declare that the total content of that which the sense world presents to us is but an inner world of sensation or feeling and then to endeavor to tack on something external or outside of it is a wholly impossible conception hence we must not speak of red sweet hot etc as being symbols or signs which as such are only aroused within us and to which outside of us something totally different corresponds for that which is really set going within us as the effect of such external happening is something altogether other than what appears in the field of our sensations if we want to call that which is within us a symbol then we can say these symbols make their appearance within our organism in order to mediate to us the perceptions which as such in their immediacy are neither within nor outside of us but belong on the contrary to that common world of which my external world and my internal world are only parts in order to be able to grasp this common world i must it is true raise myself to that higher plane of knowledge for which an inner and an outer no longer exist i know quite well that people who pride themselves on the gospel that our entire world of experience builds itself up out of sensations and feelings of unknown origin will look contemptuously upon these remarks as for instance dr eric adikis in his book kant contra haeckel observes condescendingly quote, at first people like haeckel and thousands of his type philosophize gaily away without troubling themselves about theory of knowledge or critical self-reflection such gentlemen have no inkling of how cheap their own theories of knowledge are they suspect the lack of critical self-reflection only in others. Let us leave to them their wisdom. Nicholas of Cusa expresses some very telling thoughts bearing directly upon this very point. The clear and distinct way in which he holds apart the lower and the higher knowledge enables him on the one side to arrive at a full and complete recognition of the fact that man as a sense being can only have in himself processes which as effects must necessarily be altogether unlike the corresponding external processes while on the other side it guards him against confusing the inner processes with the facts which make their appearance in the field of our perceptions and which in their immediacy are neither outside nor inside but altogether transcend this opposition of in and out but nicholas was hampered in the thorough carrying through of these ideas by his priestly garments so we see how he makes a fine beginning with the process from knowing to not knowing at the same time we must also note that in the domain of the higher knowledge or ignorance he unfolds practically nothing but the content of the theological teaching which the scholastics also give us certainly he knows how to expound his theological content in a most able manner he presents us with teachings about providence christ the creation of the world man's salvation the moral life which are kept thoroughly in harmony with dogmatic christianity it would have been in accordance with his mental starting point to say i have confidence in human nature that after having plunged deeply into the science of things in all directions it is capable of transforming from within itself this knowing into a not knowing in such wise that the highest insight shall bring satisfaction in that case he would not simply have accepted the traditional ideas of the soul immortality salvation god creation the trinity and so forth as he actually did but he would have represented his own 
but nicholas personally was however so saturated with the conceptions of christianity that he might well believe himself to have awakened in himself a not knowing of his own while yet he was merely bringing to light the traditional views in which he was brought up but he stood upon the verge of a terrible precipice in the spiritual life of man he was a scientific man now science primarily estranges us from the innocent harmony in which we live with the world so long as we abandon ourselves to a purely naive attitude towards life in such an attitude to life we dimly feel our connection to the world whole we are beings like others forming links in the chain of nature's workings but with knowledge we separate ourselves off from the whole we create within us a mental world wherein we stand alone and isolated over against nature we have become enriched but our riches are a burden which we bear with difficulty for it weighs primarily upon ourselves alone and we must now by our own strength find the way back again to nature we have to recognize that we ourselves must now fit our wealth in the stream of world activities just as previously nature herself had fitted in our poverty all evil demons lie in wait for man at this point his strength can easily fail him instead of himself accomplishing this fitting in he will if his strength thus fails seek refuge in some revelation coming from without which frees him again from his loneliness which leads back once more to the knowledge that he feels a burden into the very womb of being into the godhead like nicholas of cusa he will believe that he is travelling his own road and yet in reality he will be only following the path which his own spiritual evolution has pointed out for him now there are in the main three roads which one can follow when once one has reached the point at which nicholas had arrived the one is positive faith forcing itself upon us from without the second is despair one stands alone with one's burden and feels the whole universe tottering with oneself the third road is the development of the deepest most inward powers of man confidence trust in the world must be one of our guides upon this third path courage to follow that confidence whithersoever it may lead us must be the other and of cardinal nicholas of cusa by rudolf steiner from mystics of the renaissance and their relation to modern thought published in german in 1901 translated by bertland keitley in 1911